welcome to this episode of eTech. Today we're going to be tearing down a Square D Series B starter, and it's an EMA rated starter. We'll uh, take a look at its characteristics, how it's put together, and hopefully we'll get it back together at the end, and we'll test it again. Just to start off with, as an introduction, we could look at the way that it's set up. NEMA rated starters at the top all have a contactor section that makes and breaks the contacts of the power going to the motor. On the bottom end, typically have an overload section. That is what verifies that the power going to the motor has the right amount of current. If that is too high for an excessively long time, the heater section or that particular phase that's heating up will uh, trip out the circuit. And in that case, we have a way of controlling the circuit to be able to turn it off before damage occurs to the motor. Now before we actually tear into it, I've got it set up as a circuit, as a three-wire circuit. That means that we have a separate push button to start it and to stop it. And um, we'll take a look at how that works here in just a second. The other thing I have is a meter that I've got set up in line. and I'll just turn it on to the milliamp setting to be able to tell us how much current the coil actually draws. That's important, especially if you have a control transformer that only gives a limited amount of current to the control system. Sometimes we're asked to add more to a control system, and then it doesn't perform properly because we don't have enough capacity available in the control transformer. All right, we're set to go. My wiring is all set up. I have a meter in line with the circuit, and I've got a stop button and a start button right here. I'll hit the start button and it has drawn in the coil. You can hear it hum. Sometimes if it hums excessively, you'll find that either in the contacts below or in part of the, uh, the carriage system for the starter that there is dirt or rust and it doesn't mate up the two surfaces properly and it'll buzz quite loudly. And so we'll show you how to check for that as well. So this particular starter draws about a third of an amp, a little less than that, 294 milliamps. That's this coil. Now each coil will also have a voltage rating. My particular setup, because most of my control voltages are 120 volts, have a 120 volt coil. If that is not your control voltage, then this coil needs to be swapped out. The control voltage can be completely independent of the line voltage coming into the motor. We just have to convert it to the right voltage so that all of our controls work well. Very good, I'll hit the stop button and we'll take a look at some of the features of this particular starter. Like I mentioned, the top section, this section here, that is the actual contactor. It is an electromechanical relay that makes and breaks the power conductors coming to the motor. L1, L2, and L3 are the power conductors coming in. They go through a set of double brakes and then down through the overload section. Now one thing to note, these overloads here, and in this case they're literal heaters, in some cases that's done electronically, these overloads don't actually break the circuit when they get too hot. All they do is perform a function to tell us that they're getting too warm, and there is a contact on the left hand side here that opens up, and it's that contact that we interpret as uh, a problem and thus shut the circuit down. There are times where perhaps it's not wise to shut the circuit down immediately upon sensing an overload because whatever the driven machinery is might be in a bad position. It might pose an additional danger. And so instead we use the overload section to give us an alarm and then the operator can make it safe and turn it off separately. Very good. I will disconnect this. And then we'll take a look at some of the internal features. Uh, earlier I had mentioned that these overloads are what give us control over the temperature of the motor 
And really, this is what protects the windings of the motor. It's also what protects the insulation of the power conductors that feed the motor. Quite often, our short circuit and ground fault protection is quite large, and that is so that the inrush current of the motor doesn't trip out the fuse or circuit breaker. However, these heaters, when they do trip, have a really interesting function. So what I'll do is I'll take one of these out, of the circuit and what we're able to see is that there is kind of a little knurled knob here. That knurled knob when the heater is cold is perfectly solid. You can't move it. And in its normal state there's a little spring right here called a pawl, P-A-W-L, that pushes up against that knurled knob. And so when you press the reset it pulls it back and then it pushes up against that knurled surface that we have here. If the heater gets too warm, that knurled knob spins freely. This kind of a, a heater or overload is called a eutectic alloy. And in other words, there's a, a tube here that's filled with an alloy that, when it gets too warm, becomes liquid and allows this particular knob to spin freely. And that is the whole safety mechanism for overload protection. I'll try to demonstrate that real briefly. with a flame. And now that the body of this overload is hot, notice how freely this little knurled knob spins. And once it's cool again, that completely solidifies and we can put it back into the starter and it'll perform its function. Now only one of these has to actually trip out. It doesn't matter which one of these, this is a three-phase starter. And so we've got line one, line two, line three. If only one of these starts spinning, that pawl will push past it and this contact right here will open up. Sometimes it'll appear as if the reset has caught the way to check that is to put an ohmmeter between these two terminals right here. And if it's closed, that's fine. Then the overload really is good. However, if everything looks good up top, yet it is open, you'll know that you've got a problem with the overload really. And this is still spinning rather freely, rather warm. Next, we want to give our attention to the actual contactor body. There are three main contacts, one for each line, L1, L2, and L3, as well as an auxiliary contact. The auxiliary contact is right here. You'll notice that it's labeled 3 and 2 on this particular body, and if you look at the wiring chart, you'll see that wires number 3 and wire number 2 also connect to that. Wire 2 and 3 come from the start button and the auxiliary contact parallels the start button. You can see part of the auxiliary contact right here. When the main contactor draws in, it pushes down on this auxiliary contact and also closes between these two terminals. And that will then take the place of the start switch or start button so that we can let go of the start button. It's only when we press the stop button that power drops out to the entire starter. You'll also notice that there are a couple of wires that usually come pre-wired. So for example, this one right here that goes between terminal 3 and one side of the auxiliary contact or holding contact comes out and is wired to one side of the coil. The other side of the coil is then wired to one side of the overload contact and the overload contact then goes back to complete our circuit. Let's take a look at the top assembly here. And what I'll do is I'll remove a couple of screws. And a 
couple of wires so they don't impede us. And this particular starter, what we have is a cover plate. And the cover plate is important because it indicates what size starter it is. This particular starter is a size double aught. And uh, in the NEMA system, a certain size starter can have a range of voltages and with it a range of horsepowers that it's able to drive. And that's been standardized. You can look at the uh, video description and the links at the bottom and I'll have a link for a standard table there for you. So a double aught is on the very small side of a starter and the larger the number, so a single aught, then a size one, a size two, a size three, a size four, each gets progressively bigger and is able to handle more current. So I'll take the cover plate off, the face plate, and that then exposes the top of the coil. Here it is. And we are able to lift out the coil and part of the carriage. Essentially, it's an electromagnet. When the coil is energized, the electromagnet, and that's the electromagnet right here, draws in part of this armature. And sometimes there's a bit of dirt or grime or rust that gets in between the two halves of the armature right here. And I'll sit here and it'll vibrate. And it'll buzz back and forth. And that's quite often what happens when you have a noisy contactor. If you clean that out, you're going to have a much, much quieter contactor. If your starter comes in and it doesn't have the right control voltage, the only thing that you need to do is order the correct coil and replace the coil with one that has the correct control voltage. So we'll set those things aside. And you'll notice inside that there is a mechanism. So when the electromagnet energizes, it pulls this mechanism forward. And as it does so, it plunges down and a set of contacts inside then close. And so we'll try to get at those contacts to be able to show you what those look like. This also tells you that you can bump test, sometimes for rotation with three phase motors. If you reverse two of the three leads, you get the opposite rotation. And so what we'll do quite often before we actually fire the thing up, We'll take a screwdriver and just depress this briefly to see which way the motor is going to be rotating in. And that way we know it's correct rather than turning it on to full speed and finding out that it's spinning the wrong way. If that happens to be a, uh, a pump, it might spin off the impeller and nobody is happy when that happens. So phase rotation is something that's very important with three phase motors and machines. There are two more screws. I'll take those loose. And what they will do is they will allow us to take this carriage body off and I'll flip it around and you can see the pads of the contacts. And these here, they're almost brand new. And you'll notice that, for example, right here you've got a set of double brakes. For each line, there are two pads. What that allows it to do is when it makes or breaks, the arc gets extinguished rather quickly. It gets divided up across two surfaces or two points rather than just having a single arc that then takes longer to extinguish. Inside of the bottom you see the corresponding pads and those two are a set of double breaks and double makes. So for each phase we've got two contact points and that helps distribute the energy across when it's trying to extinguish the arc. Some large contactors will have arc shoots and the larger the contactor is, the larger a NEMA size that it has, the larger this pad is going to be. One of the things, if you have an old starter that's giving you some trouble, is to take this apart and take a look at the contact surfaces. One word of advice, and these are all replaceable, is that you replace these as a set. Pretty much like a set of brake shoes on your car. You wouldn't just replace the front left set if you've got... Uh, uh, identical brakes in the front, what you'll do is you'll do both at the same time so that both sides are braking equally. The same is true here. If you have one worn set but still good and then one brand new set that has a different depth, it's not going to perform quite as well. The make and break won't be at the same time. At times this auxiliary contact goes bad, this guy right here. That's replaceable also. You remember the auxiliary contact closes at the same time as the main contacts do, 
but it is auxiliary, it's extra. It's one that closes to take the place of the start button. And you can see the mechanism right here. That too is replaceable, but that's just a single contact. And they come in various forms as well. If you need both a normally open and a normally closed, perhaps you've got some feedback that goes into a, an electronic system, those are available as well. Now, our heater is cooled down. You notice that this is nice and rigid again. And what I want to do is pop it back in. And we'll fasten the holding screws back down. Now you might be wondering if a starter has a range of horsepowers and voltages and opacities that it's able to accommodate, how do we know which heater to put in? Well, these heaters have part numbers on them and it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. And even the, the same heater in a different size unit by the same manufacturer will perform differently because of cooling effects. And so this part number is something that one would look up in the chart. Usually it's on the inside cover of the heater or of the starter enclosure. And they are sized to the full load and capacity of the motor. So you need the nameplate of the motor, look up in the chart what it gives you for a heater number that adequately protects that motor. That's what you would choose to put in here. What I want to briefly show you is a method of verifying that the overload is good. You can do so with a standard ohm meter. And I'm going to select audible. That way if the switch is closed, It should beep. And right now I've got all three of my heaters in, inserted. They're all screwed down, buttoned down, but my overload is still open. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes we'll go and do some work on it. Perhaps we'll take one of the heaters out and inspect something inside. We have to press the reset because that particular pawl is still sticking up. Just because we've put the heater back in doesn't automatically reset the starter. So when I press reset, there we go. We've got continuity across that contact again. And if any one of the pawls pops back out, at that point our overload would be tripped again. Very good. Let's put this back together and see if it'll work for us.
All right, now that we have the whole thing assembled again, we're going to reconnect our power to it. Wire number three and wire number two go right here. These are the two that come off paralleling the start button. And then in my case, neutral will come off the bottom end right here. I'm feeding separate power to this. So my wire number one, which is the power to the, to the actual system for controls, comes off elsewhere. If we were to tap it off the starter, you notice that it gives us a number one right there. But we're not using that particular setup. So I need my wire number three first, because that sits on the bottom. Then my wire number two, and then my return, which happens to be a neutral in this case. and my return wire in neutral coming off the bottom of the overload section. And that might seem a little unusual because really the overload section is something that will turn the circuit off and in general wiring we don't put a switch into the neutral. But in this case that's okay because this is not general wiring. It is something that is absolutely permitted by the electrical code. And it's something that we've done for many, many a year. Very good. Let me grab my control station. I'll bring it back in. That way we can also see the indicator lights. And when I press the start button, that's better. And when I press the start button, it energizes. When I press the stop button, it drops back out. And let's energize it. And if we were to, and don't do this on a live circuit with bare hands and a screwdriver, I don't have any power on this section right here because I'm not actually running a motor at this time. But if we were to trip an overload, the whole system drops out until we press reset. Uh, if the overload tripped because the motor was too hot, then this heater would still be too hot and we wouldn't be able to reset it. Now you notice that the control circuit dropped out. With a three wire circuit it will not automatically restart. We have to go and press the start button again to be able to start the system. Well I hope you enjoyed this particular video. We will be doing other starters, other models, and other brands, and other ways of protecting in the overload section coming soon. So if this video has been useful to you, Please subscribe and let others know about our website. Thank you, and thanks for watching.